Hi, Brian. Uh, is Laura there? There you go. Hi. All working for you there, Brian, is it? Laura. Yeah. Laura, how's the, how's the quality of my video and, and audio? Yeah, grand. Okay, yeah. I think says it's a very slow connection, but it seems to be working. I was going to reboot it. I could, but let's check one more time before we start. So anyone listening in, uh, we've just come to seven o'clock. We'll give a few more people a chance to join us late, start in a couple of minutes. So just bear with us, would you momentarily? Yeah. So, Laura, are we still doing okay? Yeah, good to go. Okay, well, um, I see it's about the 20 there online. Do you want me to wait a couple more minutes or go? Uh, well, no, look, go ahead. I can waffle on. Um, so you're going to start the recording, are you? Yeah. Okay, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this July meeting of Astronomy Ireland. Tonight, we're delighted to have Brian Harvey again given one of his excellent talks on space. This time, the title of his new book, European and Russian Cooperation in Space, which we'll tell you more about in a moment. If you're new to these talks, then briefly what we do, we'll tell you what's been happening in astronomy in Ireland since our last meeting a month ago. Our meetings are normally held on the second Monday of the month. Then we'll have our main speaker, Brian, and then we'll have a, a chance for some questions at the end. And I'll tell you briefly what's happening in the sky. Some big events coming up, uh, but it's all in the magazine anyway. And then you can have a little informal chat session if you want to ask any general questions. Uh, after all that or sign off for the evening. So that's our plan, a bit of past, present and future. So uh, in terms of asking questions, you can uh, we can get you to unmute your audio at the end or you can use the chat box and we'll uh, read some of your questions out there. Uh, so do tell us where you're from, by the way, because the great thing about these Zoom meetings is in the old days, they were we were physically tied to Dublin. Uh, and now we can have members from all 32 counties, which is a fantastic development. We should have done a long time ago. But we hadn't heard of Zoom about 18 months ago. Uh, and now I think it's <laughs> become world famous. So very useful for a national organization like ourselves. And my name, by the way, is David Moore. For any of you that are new, I'm the founder of the Society and editor of our magazine. Um, we're going to tell you a little bit about what Astronomy On does for any newcomers. 
Uh, we've had more people joining during all the lockdowns we've had than ever before. Our membership has skyrocketed uh, to the point where we've never seen anything like it in the 30 year, 31 year nearly existence of Astronomy Ireland. We'll be 31 years old, in fact, on August the 1st, just a few weeks away. That's great to see. We're hoping to keep that momentum going and take society to even greater heights. We're nearly as big as we've ever been during the Celtic Tiger, the society membership boomed, and we're not far off that record. So you'll hear more about that if we do break that record. It was our 30th birthday last year, so sort of spoiled by that pesky virus. So we're hoping to have some celebrations toward the end of this year, all going well. You'll find out more about that as time goes on. So a little bit about what Astronomy Ireland does. Obviously, we publish Astronomy Ireland magazine, which any members should already have your July issue. Uh, in fact, we're working on the August one at the moment. That comes out every month and tells you what to see in the sky. Brian is a columnist. We're delighted that he contributes such an authoritative article every month. Uh, I try to write what to see in the sky. And Anne Dunn puts the whole thing together with news from around the universe, but especially Irish news, because there are a lot of researchers in Ireland who are at the forefront of astronomical research and we'd like to get their comments and put things into perspective. So we think it's a fantastic magazine. Relative to population, Astronomy Island is the world's most popular astronomy club. Uh, so why shouldn't it be? Uh, so we have these lectures as well, which happen every month. If you go to our website, you can see past lectures are available uh, going back years. Uh, we keep them all on DVD. So if you want to get any of those from Professor Brian Cox gave us a talk in the past to Astronomers Royal and all aspects of astronomy in space. There's a big list there on the blind on our website, astronomy.ie. The other thing we're very proud of our evening classes for beginners. They take place twice a year and you can enroll now for the ones coming up in October. A lot of people already have. Uh, so do check that out on astronomy.ie. You'll see the link there. We used to do lots of watches where we'd get telescopes at various places around the country and let members of the public look through them to try and get them inspired by the hobby. Obviously, physical gatherings like that aren't really possible. We did have a mini one for the partial eclipse of the sun on June 10th, which you may have seen all over RT and the rest of the media. Uh, there's clips of that on our YouTube channel if you missed it. There will be another eclipse yeah. of the sun next year. It won't be as good, but actually well worth watching in October of 2022. More then in the magazine. That's the watches. The big watch we run every year, Star BQ, Ireland's biggest annual star party. It takes place in the dark skies of Wicklow. One of the highest villages in Ireland, Roundwood. We take over the GA grounds there, line up huge telescopes, dozens of them, and invite the general public along to a barbecue, a night of talks, and then viewing with the telescopes after the sun goes down, it gets dark. And you can see the Milky Way with the naked eye from there, only an hour's drive from Dublin, relatively accessible from the rest of the country as well. It's set for the 4th of September this year, had to be postponed last year. So the way things are going, it's a possibility it will still go ahead in some form, but stay tuned. If you're a member, you'll be getting emails about it. If you're not yet a member, our social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those will, will carry details closer to the date. Uh, so we also give talks in schools. We've still been doing those online via Zoom uh, all during the pandemic. So if you know anyone that wants to talk, corporate schools, scout groups, uh, OEP groups, we've talked to them all. And we have a, a talk about the universe we're delighted to give there. But we also have a huge media presence. I think it's one of the things that's made astronomy on so big over the decades. I've been on radio twice today and uh, for the eclipse, we must have done over 50 live media interviews in just a couple of days. It was non-stop wall-to-wall radio stations, TV stations, newspapers, online media sources and everything, which was great to see. So uh, we, are, we think we're pretty good at getting the public engaged in astronomy. And if you like that, do join Astronomy Island and support us. You can get involved for free by our social media that we give out predictions of when to see the aurora when we see it coming we normally get two days notice uh, also the international space station and other interesting satellites like those starlinks especially after their launch they are a bit of a vermin that could spoil astronomy in the future but they do look pretty i have to admit uh, especially when 60 of them fly over one after the other almost touching each other absolutely amazing sight um, and as well as all that 
Uh, I'll tell you more about the International Space Station later on because it's going to be in evening skies. But that's a, a brief just what we do. If you like all that, you want to get a magazine, do join Astronomy Island if you're not already a member. Astronomy.ie is the website. You'll see the join link there. We'd love to have you as members. So what's been happening since our last meeting? Uh, the last meeting was on uh, June the 14th. It was given by Dr. Meg Schwamm from Queen's University Belfast now, but formerly from Hawaii and all over the US. Uh, she gave some, a fantastic talk about the planets of the solar system, her research interest. She also sits on a, a project that's very appropriate for our next lecture, our August lecture, which is about the telescopes that are coming in the next decade. And she's involved with one of those, the Vera Rubin telescope, which is a ridiculous camera that will survey the entire sky every three days and pick up extremely faint objects, finding millions of objects within our solar system. It's been a long time in the planning, a huge project. And if you're interested in that and everything else you have to say about the solar system, you can get that talk online or as a DVD, check out the website if you missed that one. Uh, other things that have been happening since our last meeting was, uh, every week we send out an email just to our paid up members. And we were telling you about this Nova that's exploded in Cassiopeia, the W-shaped oh. constellation that's easy to see in the North every evening. In fact, it's up all night long. And it's a crazy Nova, because normally they flare up in brightness and then fade away, usually after a few days or weeks. This one has been bouncing around. It keeps flaring up to naked eye visibility, then it dims down to binoculars, then it came back up to naked eye visibility again, I just checked that before the meeting and it's faded down definitely to binocular visibility, but who knows what it's going to do. We'll keep you posted in our weekly email. They usually go out on either Tuesday night or Wednesday morning. Uh, there's been a, some huge sunspots crossing the sun. The one that we alerted to you to on the members' email last week was much bigger than the Earth, beginning to get close to the size of Jupiter. Uh, we haven't seen sunspots that big in years. And we had one or two aurora alerts since the last meeting. Unfortunately, the weather didn't cooperate from Ireland with any of them, or they came early or late when it was bright. Especially this time of year in Ireland, we don't get many hours of darkness. So we've been having uh, lots of fun with things to see in the sky. Uh, things a bit close to the ground. We had the sky at night. Uh, we used to have Sir Patrick Moore come over and give talks uh, during the 80s and 90s. And we've had everybody else from the sky at night TV crew, except Maggie Adair and Pocock. Obviously, no one's giving me lectures recently, but we do hope to get her in at one stage. We've had Chris Lintott um, and Pete Lawrence and all the rest of them. Uh, so, we, uh, as perhaps the, certainly the longest running astronomy show, we always like to promote that. It only comes out once a week, oh, sorry, once a month on BBC Four. It was on last night around 10 o'clock, but it will be repeated if you missed it on Wednesday at 11.40 p.m. on BBC Four. So, do watch out for that. The subject this month was how the search for extraterrestrial life has gone over the last six decades of the TV show. You'll see Sir Patrick there in some archive clips. And of course, the big news that we've kept the last because it ties in nicely with the theme of tonight's talk is that Richard Branson has just become an astronaut, at least according to NASA's definition. Some people are debating that. And then the latest British astronaut along with five other members of his team, Virgin Galactic, which has some nice Irish links in that we've interviewed uh, the, one of the managers of Virgin Galactic, Stephen Attenborough, who was here in Dublin in 2008. He told me there were five Irish people who had paid the then $200,000, I believe it's now gone up to $250,000, uh, to go into space. Uh, key amongst them was Bill Cullen, you may remember from the Irish version of The Apprentice when he was the Renault distributor. Uh, he's still involved in the car business. Hopefully he's still got his ticket because he told me that he first heard of this Virgin Galactic project when he was on a charity walk through the Channel Tunnel with Richard Branson, who told him about this crazy Virgin Galactic idea. And Bill told me he wrote him a check for $200,000 on the spot. So he thinks he's the first Irish person that's paid and he should be the first one that goes into space. So if we don't get an astronaut through the European Space Agency or some other means from Ireland, then it looks like Bill will, at least for a couple of minutes, be in space perhaps next year and will get that title for himself. Uh, Richard Branson, by the way, was also the second oldest person that's ever been in space. He's 71 later this month. And 
uh, the oldest was John Glenn, who was an original NASA astronaut. And they had lots of data on him when he was young. So they reflew him as a US senator when he was 77. And he will be, is, will be or is the oldest person in space. But the next thing that's coming is Jeff Bezos of Amazon fame, the world's richest man, is planning to launch himself, his brother, and one of the early uh, Mercury astronauts who was female that didn't get selected by NASA. And she'll be in her 80s when she goes up and she'll have the record then of uh, oldest person in space. So that's going to be another fun mission coming up on July 20th. I'll remind you to watch that one. We've done a couple of radio interviews about it already today. If you want to hear more about all this kind of thing, uh, so go along to astronomy.ie forward slash audio and you'll hear some of our audio recordings there. So that's a nice big story that happened uh, just in the last day. Uh, a good, a good uh, happy story because it all went so successfully well for them. So one thing we like to do in astronomy on is keep an eye on space as well as astronomy. And we're, as I said, delighted to have Brian Harvey, who's a writer and broadcaster on space flight, who lives in Ireland. Now you may have seen him on TV and certainly heard him on radio over the years. He is really a phenomenal expert. He's given many talks to Astronomy Ireland in the past, uh, but he started out uh, with a degree in history and political science from Trinity College. And then he got a master's from UCD. His first book was The Race into Space, the Soviet space program back in 1988, when things weren't as open as they were now. And that showed the kind of research that Brian can do. Uh, that is an internationally acclaimed book. But he's had other books about the Russian, Chinese, European, Indian, and Japanese space programs. Uh, the most recent one being China in Space uh, from 2019, which is now being translated into Chinese for that market, Chinese market. Um, but his most recent book just publishes European Russian cooperation in space, which is what he's going to talk to us about this evening. Uh, but we're also delighted, and I want to personally thank him, that he's been a monthly columnist for Astronomy Island magazine with his insight into space. Uh, and we are delighted that he contributes to the magazine that way because this gives us a world class author uh, to to rave about in our own magazine and an Irishman to boot. And so we thank you very much for that, Brian. Hopefully you'll keep it up for a long time to come. He's given many public lectures to Astronomy on as well, for we're also extremely grateful. Uh, and tonight he's going to tell us about European-Russian cooperation in space. And I can think of no better person to tell us all the secrets and ins and outs and Cold War intrigues. And it's almost going to be like a spy novel, I'm guessing. So thank you very much, Brian, and over to you. OK, David, thank, <clears throat> thank you very much indeed. I'm going to ask for um, participants to bear with me for just a moment while I put up the PowerPoint um, presentation that I have for you, uh, which is going to take uh, just, a, uh, I hope, only a minute. And I hope technically we're going to be all right on this. Share screen. Okay, now I need somebody there to tell me, uh, can you actually see the top page of the PowerPoint? That's great, Brian. Yeah, yeah that's very good. So we are go for launch, are we? We'll go for launch. Okay, well, let's go ahead. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to speak this evening. Um, as David kindly mentioned already, um, this presentation is based around uh, the Springer Praxis book, which has just been published. So what I uh, am proposing to do this evening is tell you a little about the story and outcomes of European-Russian cooperation in space, but also to ask the questions, why cooperate? Who benefits? In what areas? Which countries in Europe participated more or less? Who wasn't there? What were the problems? How does this all relate to the politics of the Cold War? The culture of the different space programs, whether opportunities missed and what comes next. So it's about the past and the present and the future of European-Russian cooperation in space. And I'd be happy to take questions at the end. Uh, it might be easier if you put in comments on the chat so that I can hear you properly, but let's come to that later. 
First of all, who started it? Well, based on the title of the book, it was General President Charles de Gaulle, the president of France from 1959 to 69. <clears throat> and in 1966, he made a week long visit to the uh, USSR. He went to launch a, watch a rocket launch at Baikonur. He was the first Western visitor there. And uh, we come to the politics a lot here because he believed that France should have a very independent minded foreign policy, that France should be equidistant from the US and the USSR, unlike, for example, Britain, which wanted to be closely associated with the United States. He wanted France to be Europe's leading space power. In fact, when there was a cabinet meeting to discuss it, the meeting of the cabinet to discuss would France have a space programme took less than half an hour and they all agreed on it and off they went, unlike some other countries which took a lot of time deciding. So he saw it as an instrument of the modernisation of France, which let's, rem let's remember was quite um, desolate after the end of the, the Second World War. The USSR, by contrast, was isolated by sanctions brought against it by the NATO countries from 1949 onwards and felt a high degree of isolation from which it wished to break out. Here is de Gaulle visiting Baikonur in June 1966 when he arrived in the uh, Russian plane. There you can see that on the left. He was greeted there by, President, uh, by General Secretary Brezhnev and you can see him on the right there at the actual launch of Cosmos 122, which was a rather routine uh, weather satellite, uh, but there was nothing routine about the president being on Baikonur, the first Westerner to be there. At the end of his visit, there was a formal agreement between France and the USSR, uh, which set up structures of cooperation, regular meetings, uh, cooperation council and annual reunions of French and Russian scientists and engineers. Two things here were that the Soviet Union had lifting power, it had big, powerful rockets. France, by contrast, could offer some quite sophisticated instruments, for example, to study the sun. And the Soviet Union flew French instruments to Mars and Venus. And Lunachod, which you see there, which was the first moon rover, carried a laser. And that's the bright object on the front. And that was pointed from the moon toward the Earth. And as a result, you were able to measure the distance of the Earth to the moon to within millimeters. And you could see that the moon is very, very slowly and gradually um, moving slightly further away from the Earth. And those Lunacod lasers, Lunacod, the first one and the second one, have been used only in quite recent years. <clears throat> A substantial volume of French instruments were, was installed on the Prognose series of solar observatories, which was a very important series, although it's not well known. Uh, the next country to um, have instruments on board a Soviet satellite was Sweden, which put them on the, in, 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 the cooperative uh, satellite called Intercosmos uh, 16 in 1976. Uh, French several French satellites were launched by the USSR, for example, the Oriol series one, two and three. Um, and you see here the Oriol scientists and engineers at the Kapustinar uh, launch base near Volgograd um, in the 1970s. And that again was one of the first time that Westerners had visited a Soviet cosmodrome in significant numbers. And the Soviet Union launched Senior 3, the joint satellites Oriol 1, 2 and 3, and they provided a lot of information about the magnetosphere, which is now well known, but it was not then. One of the important parts of the glue holding this together was the annual reunion which alternated between the Soviet Union and France, but alternated locations, generally to out of the way places. They weren't held in Bos Moscow or Paris. And these planned the next missions, agreed schedules and the sharing of results. And these scientists met for about a week to 10 days together all in one place to do this joint planning and build trust between themselves. And that was very important. The next field of cooperation was space biology, uh, which again was led by France by its uh, space agency called CNES. Uh, and then from 1987, the European Space Agency, ESA, and this was called the BION program. And you can see there on the left that the Soviet Union developed a recoverable cabin. If you think that looks like Yuri Gagarin's cabin, you're quite right. It's the same idea, but unmanned. And the Soviet Union turned it into a biological cabin and aiming 
enabling many biological cargoes to be flown in orbit for a week or more. And it was the only way, if you were a space biologist, this is the only way that you were going to get such cargoes carried. And Europe developed its own type of containers and even an external container called Biopan. And these missions ran from 1975 to 2013. And if you were a European scientist, this was your best uh, method and ticket to getting biological experiments flown in space to tell you about the effects of weightlessness and radiation in the Earth's environment on different types of biological cargoes. I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, similarly, a photon, which was the same type of cabin, did materials processing. And this was about putting crystals into orbit to develop um, uh, superconductors for computers, which were then unusual, but we now all have computers. We didn't in the 1980s. Furnaces, biological cargoes that did not require life support to study the effects on radiation in great detail on whatever samples were put into orbit. And the most astounding results were the survivability of life through re-entry. There were quite a number of experiments were conducted to see if you put life forms on the outside of a spacecraft, if you put it in something that is similar to a meteorite, can that life survive re-entry? And the answer is yes, it can under certain circumstances, which suggests that life may well have reached Earth from other planets, uh, not just whatever life we generated ourselves, but life reaching us from maybe comets, maybe other planets which had life embedded in it. And the photon um, program marked the entry of Germany into cooperation with uh, the Soviet Union, then Russia. There was a substantial European presence on deep space missions in the 1980s. The Vega probes, which was first of all, deployed balloons into the Venusian atmosphere and a lander on the surface, two of them, and then intercepted Comet Halley in 1986. The mission to Phobos in 1988, which included an Irish experiment as well. And the Interbol program, where the European Union, sorry, I really mean ESA countries and the socialist countries got together uh, and prepared this mission, which didn't fly until 1995-6. And it was another magnetosphere plasmasphere exploration program. So the amount of science generated by these missions went on for years and generated hundreds of scientific papers. Next, there was the Great Observatory series. <clears throat> and these were five, six important observatories. The first was Astron, uh, 1983 with France. Uh, I'm going to come back to the, the second one in a moment. Grenat, also with France, and the French paid for that project to be maintained when the Soviet Union's money disappeared in the new Russia, Gamma with France, Spectre R, Radio Astron, in which many countries participated, and most recently Spectre RG, which is one of the most successful deep space astronomy missions underway right now, uh, <clears throat> generating a map of the universe, a radiation map of the universe, and from which much more may be expected. In 1987, um, Britain got to fly a large instrument on the Cavant module of the Mir space station. And it got into orbit just in time, for those who can remember it, the 1987 supernova. Uh, however, this mission was very little publicized. If you watch British television, David mentioned earlier the sky at night, you won't see many programs about it. Uh, the British telescope broke down at one stage and two cosmonauts, uh, Vladimir Titov and Musa Manarov, made a spacewalking repair, repair job on it outside this, the Mir space station. The first ever big telescopic repair in orbit. Again, it passed without very much press coverage. The British government permitted its scientists to take part in this mission but did not encourage them in the slightest bit and told them that um, whatever is going to happen, you will certainly not get any government money from your participation. But British astronomy 
uh, benefited enormously from this mission and got scientific reports back into the 1980s, although because of the Cold War, there was almost no press coverage on it. So from the science missions, and here you see a, um, the German story, which became more and more important. Uh, you see the joint planning of missions and the sharing of results. It went from flying instruments at the very beginning to inviting uh, Europe inviting Russia, Russia invited Europe into the concept planning stage. So you'd invite people onto your project from the very, very beginning. It gave access by Russia to Europe's top scientists and vice versa. This was top level frontline research. It was not obscure, unimportant research. It was a French story, then an ESA story, and then a German story. But who wasn't there? Britain wasn't there. Italy wasn't there. Uh, Britain certainly discouraged by government. Italy, I'm not sure why, possibly the, the same thing. This, these, these projects and programs were poorly documented and they were not popularized. If you'd been following spaceflight in the 1980s or 90s, you would have seen very little about this. And they had all the practical problems of the pre-internet age. How do you communicate? when there are hardly any phone lines between Europe and the Soviet Union. How do you get your data back? Well, what used to happen was that the big old tapes, like old tape recorder reels, would be handed to anyone, scientist or not, who was known to them, traveling between Moscow and Europe, and they brought them back on the plane, or they used the embassies or they might have a telephone call from time to time. But if you were a scientist and you went to Russia there, you could be gone a week and your family wouldn't hear from you. How could they? Uh, because there were only 10 telephone lines, whatever, between the two countries. Uh, but it meant you got to know your hosts very well in the intervening period. Let's move on to human spaceflight. France, again, dominant. France requested a flight on a Soviet spacecraft in 1974. This eventually happened in 1982. It was called the PVH or the Premier Vol Habité. And it was a French astronaut, Jean-Luc Chrétien, who flew on Soyuz T6. And he was allowed to bring with him, or was launched in advance, 310 kilograms. That's a lot of medical, biological, and materials experiments, which was loaded into the Salute uh, 6 orbital station, sorry, excuse me, Salute 7 orbital station, and they were ready for him when he got there. So this enabled a big advance in French uh, human-tended experiments in Earth orbit. France asked for and got a second mission in 1988, also by Jean-Luc Chrétien, which lasted a month and was the first European space walk. France got five more missions up to 1999, one of 189 days. So one European is going from a week in 1982 to 189 days. And this made possible a huge expansion in European human spaceflight experience. Germany got flights to Mir from 1992 and 1997. And then there were the Euromir missions, which were long stay missions in 1994 and five. And they were taken by German astronauts. The other Europeans, uh, Austria got a mission in, I think it was 1990, and many commercial companies paid for it, particularly mineral water companies for some reason. Um, Britain was invited to participate in a mission, but the government did not support it. OK, um, and uh, this was the mission undertaken by Helen Sharman, who I'm sure is known to most people. However, in the subsequent history that was written, and particularly when Tim Peake got to fly for Britain in more recent years, uh, Helen Sharman's mission, which received very little media coverage in Britain at the time, uh, we were told later she didn't fly the flag. Now, as you can see from my photograph of her spacesuit, see if you can see the Union Jack there. I think most people probably can. Uh, so her mission was a great success, despite government disapproval. Um, these missions, all of them, enabled high volume, long duration, uh, spacewalking and other experiments by Europe that were not otherwise possible because you could not do long duration flights on the American shuttle. And this spelt up European human spaceflight experience before the international space stations. These experiments, sorry, these flights were 
politically quite controversial in France and President Mitterrand came under a lot of pressure to cancel them, which he would not. And from Russia, the big advantage from 1992 was they brought cash to keep its space program going. Over the years 2001 to 19, there were 19 human spaceflight missions to uh, the International Space Station. Russia provided the um, rendezvous and docking system for the European uh, transport vehicle. Europe provided the um, uh, uh, computer systems uh, for the Zvezda and data systems. Russia provided the Startran, which you, you see in the picture there, for training. Russia provided the launch occupation of the ISS, landing, ESA decided which experiments to send. They extended European long duration missions to six months, and this enabled Europe to operate its own exper experiments on the Columbus module and do spacewalks. And the countries participating were France, Italy, Belgium, Spain, the Netherlands, Germany, Denmark, and finally Britain there with, with Jim Peake at the end. Europe's robotic arm is just about to fly into orbit. Um, this is on the right here. It's a big um, object. It's over half a ton. It's 11 meters long. It can lift eight tons. It has an accuracy of five millimeters. It has seven joints and it's being attached to the uh, 20 ton Nauka scientific module, which was due to be launched this week, but it's been delayed till next week. Um, if the ISS is visible, you will be able to see Nauka chase the ISS and then hopefully dock with it later in the month. But this is a big contribution by Europe to its cooperation with Russia on the International Space Station. There have been many joint experiments run between Russia uh, and Europe on the ISS, principal of which is Matroshka, who you see on the right, who is a robotic human fitted with thousands of electrodes to test the effect of radiation outside the spacecraft. And that's terribly important if you're going to fly to Mars or other distant destinations. Plasma crystal, which I'll explain to you in a moment. Expose, which is putting life forms on the outside of the space station, bringing them in six months later and see, are they still alive? Well, yes, they often are. Icarus, which is following storks and swans and other birds as they migrate across Europe. Contour, which is testing telerobotics. In other words, can you command a robot to operate on Earth from space? Yes, you can, but it's, it's not as easy as it looks. And then two long duration simulation missions on the ground in which European um, astronauts, inverted commas, participated. Mars 105 because it went 105 days and Mars 520 because it was 520 days. And I want to give you one practical example of this cooperation. It's called Plasma Cristal. Sorry, there's an S missing in Cristal. And on the left, you see Elena Serva with the Plasma Cristal 4. And what it is, it tests plasma in Earth orbit. The nearest thing we have to plasma, as you know, there is solid state, there's liquid state, there's gas state, and there's plasma. The nearest thing we come to plasma, by the way, is milk foam in your coffee, because it is neither solid nor liquid nor gas. But Plasma Cristal has tested how you can develop sterilizer. And from this, a handheld sterilizer has been developed from this instrument, which treats chronic um, uh, infections in the skin, um, uh, bacterially resistant wounds, ulcers, skin damage, and burns. And it can be done with that instrument. You can see the size of it in your local surgery. And that comes from the Plasma Cristal German-Russian experiment on the ISS. So some practical issues. And I'm coming on now to look at some of the practice issues here. Europeans found Soviet institutions impenetrable at the beginning. They did not understand how the thing worked. They didn't know the people and they had to build relationships with them. And that took a lot of time. It was slow and it worked. It was run through the International Council for Space Cooperation in the Soviet Union called Intercosmos. There were big problems about access to facilities, cosmodromes, launch sites, and the places where these things were built called the Zavod. Zavod is the Russian word for a factory. And these were big issues. In the old Soviet Union, and you were a Soviet scientist, you made a space instrument and you handed it over to the Zavod. And that's the last you ever saw of it until you heard that your 
instrument was in space sending you back a signal from Mars or wherever else. Um, and the French in particular say, no, this won't do. We really need to see the way in which you mount our instruments, integrate them, make sure the electrical connections are working and so on. And it took many, many, many years for the Soviet space program to open up to Western visitors and give them access to the cosmodromes and the Zavods and everything like that. So it had a, an opening effect, glasnost to use the Russian word within Russia. There were of course, a lot of problems around language. Few Europeans had learned Russian. Uh, you needed interpreters. The Russians insisted their documentation be in Russian. Well, why not? But a lot of documents had to be translated. That slowed things down. Spying. We might presume that the spying was by the Russians on the West. Well, may I reassure you that it was a two-way street. And indeed, French scientists always explained how when they returned to France, they were debriefed by, by le service afterwards. Uh, and that wasn't a catering service either. OK, there was a lot of issues around equipment. Uh, Russia was still under sanctions during most of this period and compromises had to be reached whereby the equipment would be guarded and so on. There were different technical approaches. The Russians did things very differently. Uh, the example is always given of how the Americans spent millions developing borrows for their astronauts, whereas the Soviet Union sent its cosmonauts down to the pencil shop instead. But that's just a rather simple example. But the technical approach to these problems was diff different. Uh, the best example was how do you deploy your solar panels in orbit and how do you test that? Well, the French were horrified when a man just put out his arm and pulled it open uh, on the ground. And they said, that would never work. And he said, well, it always has, um, uh, rather than much more complex systems. Russian facilities declined badly from the 1990s onwards because of cash shortage, because of the rapid shock transition to a capitalist economy. The big glasnost openness moment was Vega, because at that mission to Venus, uh, the Soviet Union invited anyone who wanted to come to come to mission control during the interception of Venus. So people were wandering around a building that they'd never seen before in their lives, but it meant that the old secrecy was gone. Star Town had its own rules and regulations. It was run very much like a military establishment, which is why the first astronauts who went from there were thankfully for themselves uh, military, uh, but civilians might have had a hard time of it. Embassies played an important role. ESA set up an office in Moscow. So these were the kind of practical things that were absolutely necessary to smooth the paths of cooperation. Plus of course, the cups of coffee at the meeting, which see on the left, the man on the left there is Dmitry Rogozin, the head of the Russian space program at the moment, and I'm going to tell you a lot more about him in a moment. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get it down here. Okay, industrial cooperation. Um, there was none uh, until recently. Uh, from 1949 to 91, uh, the Soviet Union was sanctioned under what was called COCOM and has been re-sanctioned under the, um, after the Ukrainian crisis of, of 2014. Uh, so you could not uh, have any industrial dealings with Russia, only scientific. Uh, if you wanted, for example, the Soviet Union to launch your satellite, you had to get an export license. And that was normally, though not in the cases that we've looked at earlier, refused. <laughs> Uh, the sanctions were lifted in 1991 and the West gave licenses uh, for Western satellites to be launched. Russia had a huge rocket fleet at that time. Many of them were old Cold War missiles and needed the cash. So European companies moved in to in effect be brokers so that a Western company particularly a communication satellite company that wanted a satellite launched, uh, would um, go to this company, it'll say, we'll take your satellite over, we'll bring it to Russia, we'll make sure it's put on board the rocket in Plisetsk or Baikonur, and we'll make sure it gets launched. Britain was the pioneer here with commercial space technologies, a man called Jerry Webb, followed by Germany, Eurocot and ExoLaunch, and of course, Ariane Space Bass in France. And they got full access to Russian facilities like Plisetsk Cosmodrome in the Russian far north, which you see on the right there. And this enabled multiple low cost launchings. The cost of satellite launchings came down radically 
in the 1990s and much smaller satellites now found their way into orbit. Uh, Russia had leftover Cold War missiles and also its own original rockets, the Proton still flying, Cyclone, Cosmos, Shrem, Dnieper, Soyuz, Rakot, still. And what happened here was that Western companies put new money into the Cosmodromes at Plesetsk and Baikonur, where Russia had no money. They modernized the Cosmodromes. And that cash, cash kept the Russian program going and used up old Cold War missiles and it brought the advent of small piggyback satellites. On the left, you see a European satellite going into orbit from Plisetsk. The irony though, and you saw this only last December, uh, was that Russian rockets were used to launch European spy satellites. And on what country were they going to be spying? Well, you can work that one out for yourself. The biggest venture was Soyuz Akuru, Soyuz being the Soyuz rocket, Kuru being the uh, French territory in, on the equator in South America in Guyana. And this was the largest uh, construction project in the world at the time. It was proposed by France in 1993. Europe lacked a medium lift launcher. Russia had the Soyuz dating back to 1948. This rocket was old, reliable, obsolete and profitable. And this was finally agreed in 2003. And you had the establishment of ELS, Ensemble Mont Lancement Soyuz, and a huge site clearance operation with Russian construction teams working there, building this enormous um, uh, site, which you can see on the right there. If you think it looks the same as Russia's original launch site that launched Sputnik, it is. Um, <clears throat> You might be interested to know that no one died in construction. The worst injury was a broken leg, which I think is quite an achievement. It's a very complex, sophisticated launch pattern, pa platform. It looks simple, it's not. Fuels and rockets were brought in all the way from Samara uh, in Western Russia. And that, that facility is still at work. Um, the, sorry, I'm waiting for the next slide to come up. So we're being slow here tonight. Give me a moment. Is that in Kourou, French Guiana, Brian? It is. I'm sorry, I'm not getting my next slide coming up. Just be patient, please. Oh, here we go. The first launch took place from, um, from there on the 21st of October 2011, and this was Galileo, which is the European satellite navigation system, which we may well all use, even if we don't realize it. Uh, the whole big area of the jungle was cleared. It's made 23 missions by 2020, mainly Galileo, but also European communications and observation satellites. Russia developed a multiple restart upper stage, which called the Fregat and the Breeze, which means that these satellites can reach quite high and complex orbits. If you follow these launches, they're all done in French by a, a director of operations, director des operations, and it's all done through French. So it gives a very French tone to the entire thing. Hardly Francing, it, surprising it's an integral part of France. And these launches are still very high profile in France, even if they're not very much publicized here. These launches continue, and for example, one of the main launch sites at the moment is the One Web set of constellations. David mentioned earlier the Starlinks. Well, One Web is the same idea, but One Web is a bankrupt satellite const uh, constellation that Britain has bought um, in order to make sure that Britain can have its own navigation satellite system outside the European Union. Um, and um, these launches are now taking place from the new Soviet Cosmodrome in Vostochny. If you look at the bottom, you will see the Union Jack on it, okay? <clears throat> because of current relationships between Britain and Russia, only the first rocket actually carried the Union Jack, and it's since then not being carried. Uh, the future of Soyuz Akuru is unclear. There are still six to eight manifested, but it's being squeezed between the Europe light launch of Vega, the Ariane 6 coming on down, and SpaceX, which has cleaned up a lot of the commercial market. But there is some talk of a man so used launch site from there to go to the uh, Chinese space station. That may yet happen. I think there was a missed opportunity because in 2005 to 9, 
French rocket engineers joined with the original rocket factory in the world, Energomash, which was set up in 1928, uh, to develop future uh, rockets uh, and launches for Europe. Um, and it explored a whole set of new types of rocket engines like methane and fluorine. However, Europe abandoned the Ural and Barzugan programs in favor of Arizan 6. They thought it was too difficult, but in fact, SpaceX has done exactly what Ural and Barzugan had planned to do. And Ariane 6 may actually be, there's a danger it may be obsolete before it's even launched next year. So I think this was a big missed opportunity. And this is the original fluorine engine, the RD301 developed by the Soviet Union way back in the 1980s. However, there continues to be close connections there. Europe's Vega launcher uses a Soviet period upper stage, the RD843, although that's not advertised very much. And the French company Alcatel developed communication satellite designs with the big Russian communication satellite builder, the ISS Roshetnev in Krasnoyarsk, and also with the Energia Design Bureau. And you see the various stickers and posters on the side of the Proton rocket there. ExoMars, which is the final history part of the story. In the 1990s, Europe wished to start small planetary missions. Russia had left over uh, instruments from the Mars 8 project, which had failed in 1996. Russia offered the Fregat launcher. Mars Express was sent to Mars in 2003. Beagle was also on it, you may remember. It's still operating and it was, it was Mars Express that effectively discovered methane on Mars. Venus Express followed. And there's been an enormous and absolutely a gigantic scientific return from these two missions, which were the result of European Russian cooperation, mainly a Russian launcher and a European um, uh, mission, but it was, it was a lot more integrated than that seems. Netlander was a French Russian, uh, sorry, excuse me, a French American project. In 1999, there was a new French science minister called Claude Allegra. And he said, we're not going to do man flight, but we'll do a Mars sample return with the United States. And this was what the French would call a grand projet, a big project to replace human spaceflight. The problem was that Congress pulled the funding in 2000, leaving the French with nowhere to go. But cosmonaut subsequent science minister Claudie Anouye stepped in and she restored the Russian focus. And the idea of a European Russian mission to Mars will return. I'll come back to that in just a moment because in 2001, Europe declared a plan to explore nothing less than the universe uh, with the focus on Mars. And this was the first appearance of the word ExoMars to search for life on Mars with a big rover on the Soyuz from Kourou. But in 2008, the Europeans again joined with the French um, in, but um, this was again cancelled by the United States in 2011. And the American space program is always at the mercy, not of NASA, but of the Congress, which micro supervises American budgets. So France and then Europe had twice planned to do a joint project to Mars with the United States only to see it cancelled. When Russia learned this, they got on the plane straight to Paris and said, we can offer you two big proton rockets for two mission project. Uh, and uh, the Europeans said, well, thank you. You can send our um, satellites there. And Russia said, no, it has to be a joint science program. We're interested in doing science with you together. And that was agreed. And it was divided into two missions. In 2016, the Trace Gas Orbiter and an entry and lander demonstrated called Schiaparelli. And 2018, the ExoMars European rover that I mentioned to you before. Um, and this, and uh, along with um, the main contributors being Italy, which made the TGO, France and Britain, which made the rover. So it was essentially an Italian, French, Britain contribution to the ExoMars program. The Trace Gas Orbiter, its aim was to construct a model of the Martian atmosphere by understanding trace gases, i.e. gases that comprise less than 1% of the atmosphere and you need a very sophisticated sniffer 
to find it. And there was a combination of Russian and European instruments launched 14th of March 2016, arrived that October, entered orbit, aerobraked over the thin Martian atmosphere and began its science mission in 2018 and was also a relay. Schiaparelli the lander. Russia was first to soft land on Mars in 1971, but Europe had no landing experience. And Schiaparelli carried a package of Italian German surface experiments, but it crashed. The investigation found that there were, when the, the moment the parachute opened, the spacecraft oscillated wildly, which they tend to do when parachutes open, but the computer was overwhelmed. And the computer declared that the spacecraft was now flying upside down under the Martian surface and said, oh, we must have landed, so it turned the engine off. Uh, this was a very badly designed computer system because it had no sanity checks because both propositions were absurd. There was no system to recover an overwhelmed uh, computer and also the Europeans had installed incompatible ESA and American software. So the launch was delayed of the main ExoMars until 2018. So from 2018 to 2020. So it was an expensive failure. The TGO science mission though has been a great success. There have been lots of Russian European scientific papers, the French contribution and the Belgian contribution being the most evident, but written with Russian scientists. Very high quality imaging of Mars, the finding of subsurface waters, an understanding of how storms on Mars developed and evolved. The main breakthrough though by Russian scientist Oleg Koroblev was how did Mars lose its water? And we have a much better idea as to how that happened now. Oh, I've temporarily a frozen screen. Please be patient while we, I can get it to move. Please be very patient while I get this to move. I might revert to small screen and then come back to big screen, okay? No, that's not working either. Uh, while Brian does that, just a reminder, if anyone has any questions, to pop them in the chat box. Uh, you should see that near the bottom of your screen. And we'll come to those at the end of the talk. OK, I'm sorry, I'm not getting movement here yet. Can anyone help me at the Astronomy Ireland end on this? Any Zoom experts out there? You're clicking on the PowerPoint presentation, I assume. Yes. I mean, does it come up on your screen? Does it change on your screen? No, nothing. nothing's happening on my screen. It just won't move. I'm sorry. Hi, yeah. hi Brian. Uh, Tom here. Hello, do, Tom. Do you have other applications open, like email and anything else running in the background? Um, not that I'm aware of. Yeah. No, I cut it down to the minimum. Okay, that's all I can think of, Matt. We could try a new share and come back to the beginning, if you like, and go quickly through it. I don't know. Yeah, that might work too, yeah. Yeah, sometimes in PowerPoint, if you know the number of the slide, I think you can just punch the number in, and it will go yeah. to that number of slide. Sometimes if you go back one slide. Oh, oh, good idea, okay. And then go forward. No, good idea, but it's not working. Well, then if you go out of PowerPoint altogether and go back in again and just come back to where you were. What I can do is, shall I do stop share for the moment? Yeah. Yeah, try that because then you can access PowerPoint on your own computer and just make, if it doesn't work for you, it isn't going to work on Zoom. Okay. A RAM problem. Okay, I'm going back to... Um, hold on. Uh, 
There you go. Now I'm back on the next slide. I hope you are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the Mars second, second mission. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry, ExoMar second mission. Sorry for that. Sorry for that, folks. The second mission, which is still due, has two parts: a lander called Kazachok and a rover called the Rosalind Franklin, after the famous British scientist. The rover is 310 kilos, so it's bigger than the current Chinese rover, Zhurong, but it's much smaller than the American rover's Curiosity, uh, 890 kilograms, and Perseverance even bigger. There are nine Russian and European instruments. Its purpose, and this is the important bit, is to drill two meters below the surface, collect what's there, put it in a laboratory, and test for life. The landing site is the Oxia Planum for those uh, uh, astronomers who know their Martian geography. And it has 17 um, instruments. The ExoMars launch campaign was set for the 24th of July, 2020 to land in March, 2021. The same time as the launch of the UAE's HOPE, Russia's, per sorry, the US Perseverance and China's Tianwen. Russia signed off Kazachok on the right in February 2020, and its proton rocket was ready. The rover was signed off, but the European parachute extraction tests failed. The final tests were set for March in 2020 in Oregon, um, but they were. it was felt at the time that this was too much of a rush. So ExoMars 2020 became ExoMars 2022, and these are the current launch dates is the current launch date, 20th September, 2022, a landing on the 10th of June, 2023, and everything was put back in storage. Meantime, ESA has signed up for a Mars sample return mission back with the Americans in 2028 with the Netlander IDEA, an ESA orbiter and return craft, a, a European rover fetch to collect the samples from Perseverance and a NASA lander in ascent stage. And this is the original Rosalind Franklin rover on the right from the very beginning of the ExoMars project. So that's a big event to come next year and the following year. As for future European Russian missions, the main one is Luna 27 in 2025, a Russian moon lander in which Europe will provide the drill in simple in situ resource utilization, sample analysis. In other words, can you turn moon rock into water and air? The landing system, which has been contributed by Italy, Britain, and Switzerland. And there will also be European contributions to Luna 25 next year, Luna 26, Luna Globe and Orbiter. And those countries are Switzerland and Slovakia. Europe will also contribute to SPECTRE, uh, two big um, astronomical observatories, Nauka I've mentioned. But these are project contributions. They're not a joint project. ExoMars is a joint project. So there's a big difference between doing a big project together and little bits of projects here and there. And the big projects together are the best form of cooperation, I would imagine. It's also important to remember that the socialist countries had a long program of cooperation with the Soviet Union dating to the 60s. After 1989, this was continued but not advertised. It was mainly the older Russian-speaking scientists connected to institutes in Russia that continued this work. And there were political reasons for not advertising it because many of these countries had been part of a Soviet-dominated Europe that they didn't like and, and those political sentiments still lasted. <clears throat> and the focus has been on microsatellites like Compass, like Chibis, like Sergei Vernov and Obstinovka. And these are about studying the plasma around the Earth. And Obstinovka is a big instrument on the ISS. Obst and also Chibis has studies lightning and plasma in Earth orbit. So these are small but nevertheless significant scientific missions involving the countries of Eastern, geographically Eastern Europe in cooperation with Russia. The main ones are Hungary, Poland and Bulgaria. But it's interesting that Intercosmos continued. Now, my final part is about the current status of cooperation and the issues arising from cooperation. So I'm not going to tell you any more about joint programs or projects. There are no large scale programs now after ExoMars and ESA has joined the Americans for the sample return. There are no Europeans training in Star Town now. The future of Soyuz or Kuru is unclear. And several people who I asked in the past year, would you cooperate with Russia? Would ExoMars happen now? 
And they say, no, we would not do this now. The problem was that the United States and Europe introduced sanctions against Russia again in 2014. The target was the head of the Russian Space Agency, Dmitry Rogozin. The picture you see there is a very rare picture because it is Dmitry Rogozin in Vienna after he was sanctioned. And he managed to get in and out and make a speech without anyone noticing. Um, but he may not travel uh, to either the US or Europe. The fuel on ExoMars was banned by Europe. It could not fly on ExoMars. So Europe had to make a new law to give itself an exemption. Britain pulled out of the Spectre UV project because of sanctions, and it has a very strong disincentivizing effect. If you're thinking of cooperating with Russia, you know now that you're going to have to combat a whole set of sanctions, paperwork, and security problems. And in December 2020, the United States hit the Progress Plant, uh, which is the plant that makes the Soyuz rocket. And this is now threatening the International Space Station. The EU decision to hit the space program, the official reason is that Dmitry Rogozin gave a photograph of the Kerch Strait Bridge. Now, a little geography lesson. People know where Crimea is, but the eastern edge of Commission of Crimea, there's a sea, an inlet, before you reach the Caucasus on the right, which is Russian territory, okay? And the Russians built a bridge there. The idea of building a bridge there is not new, okay? It goes back to the time of the Tsar. But this bridge was seen as connecting uh, European Russia and the Caucasus to the Crimea, okay? And the bridge was condemned by the European Union. And the European Union decided that if Rogozin gave Putin a picture of this bridge, that constituted a basis for um, sanctioning him, okay? Although the European Union employs 4,600 translators, some but not all of whom translate into Russian, it instead got a machine translation of an article in the Russian newspaper, which inform its readers, very few of them, about this particular gift of a photograph album. And on that basis, uh, Rogozin was sanctioned, okay? Sanctions are always very uneven. You will be aware that Russia has vast amounts of money in the Financial Services Center here in Dublin, and that the Ohanish Lumina plant in the Shan near the Shannon is Russian owned. They're not sanctioned, okay? And my big question is, and I'm not getting involved in the political merits or reasons for sanctions or not, but why hit space cooperation? And we don't have an answer to that question. So let's look at, in conclusion, let's look at the phases of cooperation. They started with France in 1966. This is the uh, ESA office in Moscow here. ESA from the 1980s, a big expansion of the 1980s led by Germany, the introduction of industrial cooperation. In 1992, things were so giddy that was the discussion of merging the European Space Agency with the Russian Space Agency, and it would be called Eurocosmos. Over 2004 to 2005, there was a lot of intense partnership between Russia and Europe. And the space area was called an, an espace commun, a common area of space and development. And that led to the Soyuz Akuru project. The turning point though was in May 2009, when the European Union announced a partnership with countries such as Ukraine and the Caucasus. And that was the turning point because Russia saw that as bringing these countries, particularly the Ukraine, not only in the Euro into the European Union, but into NATO. And that was your proverbial, if I might use the phrase, red flag to them. But despite that, the ExoMars project did get going by 2011. I think we reckon it would not happen now. And the sanctions came on very full again in 2014. So, France and Russia has been a consistent theme in all of this. And here you see, you can tell that this is a France-Russian meeting because it's in one of the palaces in Paris, okay? And for France, this fitted in with its idea of its foreign policy, of European Union leadership, of a common Europe from the Atlantic to the Urals. There is huge French-Russian cooperation, not only in space, but across science, across industry, across research, in literature. There are multiple institutional links. 
many, many of the French institutes in all areas are linked to comparable institutes in Russia. It's not just space. There are annual frequent events, celebrations and books about Russian French cooperation. Uh, it is an important theme in French public life. Germany, though, is probably a bigger partner now, but is much less advertised. If you search the German press, you're not going to find so much reference to German Russian cooperation. The big absentees are Italy, which does a lot of trade with, the, with Russia and the Soviet Union before that, and Britain. Britain had a huge problem with spaceflight with anybody, including itself, until 1987. You'll remember that uh, in 1987, Margaret Thatcher decided that space was a matter for the private sector. Um, and um, Britain described the European Ariane rocket in which um, Ireland participates as something it didn't want to join. The Irish flag is on Ariane, the British isn't, um, and described manned space flight as Kenneth Clark called it an expensive frolic and cooperation with Russia was discouraged. So cooperation is important for who didn't do it as much as who did. So what drove cooperation? For Russia, it was to break out of its isolation. It took the view that science universally requires sharing with all countries. From 1990s, a great need for cash as the Russian economy encountered severe difficulties and contraction uh, with its, most of its economy being sold off for very little. And it valued access to European expertise in some areas, instruments and management skills, but there were many areas where Russia was way ahead anyway, so it wasn't universal. <laughs> Europe valued Russian rockets because they were powerful and had huge lifting ability. Its rocket engines were and remain the most advanced in the world. Russia's science and technology in many areas is much more advanced than Europe. Russia offered, and I put this in italics, a full spectrum sophisticated program and expertise. Russia does all aspects of spaceflight, not just some of them, like Europe. Russia in particular offered long duration human spaceflight and access to interplanetary unmanned missions, which Europe could not do for many years on its own and still finds it difficult to do. The picture on the right, by the way, is to go during his visit again. And also it gave Europe access to what it called its mysterious world of the Russian people, its language, its culture, its history, its science and its education. Uh oh, we're back in Freezeville again here. Let me try again. I'm going to try my earlier trick and see will that work. So I'm trying to get, I'm, I'm going to go back to stop share as before, if I can. Is someone else controlling the scheme? Oh, hold on. Here we go. Okay, next slide. I'm sorry about this. We're nearly at the end. And let's go back again. Uh, can you see this? Not yet. It says, make, what makes cooperation work? Have you got it? No. No, okay. No. Let, do you have it? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, let me come back again. Um, Zoom meeting. Share screen. Uh, okay, what makes... I see it now. Okay, very good. And I'm switching to full. Okay. okay. So if we ask... We're back, I'm assuming we're back on now. Okay, we're about three more to go. So what makes cooperation work? Uh, trust is the most important thing, and Russia has always kept its contra contracts. Europe has cancelled quite a few. Key individuals make cooperation work, a bit like cross-border cooperation within this country. <laughs> and those key individuals are people like on the Russian side, Mr. Sav Keldish, Brol Sigdayev, Lev Zelyony, Yuri Galprin, in France, Jacques Blamont, in Germany, Sigmund Yen, the first cosmonaut from Germany, Jerry Webb in Britain. The group work was important. The French reunions were important. Political support was really important from de Gaulle, from Pompidou, from Mitterrand, from Chirac, 
The institutions were important, the ESA office in Moscow. In Germany, the GDR, uh, which um, ended in, in, in uh, 1990, the people who worked in the GDR became the bridge between Germany, Western Germany and the Soviet Union or Russia, because those East Germans knew Russia, they knew the institutes and they knew how to speak Russian. And it has been a diplomatic priority for France and Germany. On the right there, you see on the left, Matthias Mora, European astronaut. Sorry, on the left, excuse me, on the left. On the right, you see the head of the ESA office in Moscow, René Pichel. And in the middle there, one of those, and I'm sorry, I'm not so sure, is the German ambassador to Russia. And he is in Startown. So that shows if you're an ambassador of France to, or Germany to Russia, one of the first things you do is you go to Startown and you meet the space industry. That doesn't apply to very many other countries. And I'm sorry, I'm back frozen again. If I, if I can stop share, I'll take it out and do what I did a moment ago. Ah, okay. Again, what makes cooperation hard? The opposite question. There were a lot of problems, as I've mentioned earlier, about access to facilities, the Zavod, the cosmodromes, the facilities, issues of language, of translations, of paperwork. The cultures of Russia and Europe were different. They have a different way of doing things. The Cold War intrusions and supervision uh, were definitely made things more difficult. High level politics in particular, um, space cooperation with Russia was particularly controversial in the Mitterrand period. Uh, the Americans didn't want French cooperation with Russia. Um, there was a lot of spying events during that period. Europe has been inconsistent. I think Russia must find Europe a very inconsistent partner to deal with because it has several times dropped them for the US and come back again. European decision making in the space industry is very complicated with many countries, many structures, many institutions, a slow speed, remaking decisions. So Europe has not always made it easy for Russia as a cooperating partner. There were the missed opportunities, a French satellite called Rosso in the 1960s cancelled, a French moon probe didn't happen either. Uh, Russia was offered, sorry, Russia offered um, instruments on Venera 5 to 7, the French didn't deliver them on time. France offered a balloon but then wasn't able to deliver it. There was discussion on doing Mir 1.5 together. Hermes, the European space shuttle on the right, was to have a lot of Russian equipment, Europe cancelled it. Uh, Russia offered European cooperation on its re replacement project for the Soyuz called ACTS and then Clipper. They were both cancelled. Um, Ural Barzugan fell through. Eurocosmos didn't happen. Uh, Russia proposed joining ESA twice. That didn't happen. Um, Galileo um, did happen, um, but Russia had proposed Galileo be a European Russian project. And instead, Russia ended up when Galileo was prevented from doing that, uh, sorry, Galileo was prevented by the United States, Russia built its own navigation satellite system called GLONASS or redeveloped its old one. Laplace was its joint probe to Jupiter. That didn't happen. Um, in Britain missed out big opportunities on Spectre X. Britain was offered one and a half tons of instruments on a astronomical observatory in the 1980s, um, but the government uh, wouldn't do it. Um, and Helen Sharman, again, um, was a great opportunity to do science, technology, engineering, and maths, particularly for women, but the British government did not get behind her in doing that work after her mission. In virtually every other country, a guest astronaut cosmonaut did those things. Can we think of, <coughs> An alternative narrative, I've mentioned the Cold War a lot, but does this Cold War narrative obscure a cooperative narrative that could have gone further? Let's remember that the International Geophysical Year, during which Sputnik was launched and COSPAR outlined a path of cooperation between scientists of all countries, not just Europe and Russia. That Kennedy proposed, John F. Kennedy proposed a joint lunar program in 1963, which might well have happened had he not been assassinated and replaced by Lyndon Johnson, who was not interested. Kennedy made a speech for world peace 
1963, arguably one of his greatest but least known speeches, um, which so impressed the Russians that they ordered the entire text printed in every newspaper in the Soviet Union. That could have become the basis for the great reduction in the Cold War in 1963, not 1989 or 91. France had a rapprochement with Russia from 1966, but other countries didn't follow. Gorbachev proposed a common European home when he visited Germany, and he was greeted with delirious crowds screaming, Gorby, 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 when he came. So there was a lot of potential for space research and other things to be the basis of a much more cooperative what if type of history that could have developed over the, over the period from the 1950s onwards. Arguably though, space cooperation did lessen Cold War tensions. It's a thesis of liberal politics that countries that cooperate together are less likely to fight against one another. And this would seem to be generally true though people have, may have different views. And I think uh, if I can get to it, um, my last slide is chew up now. Let me continue to see if I can get it from the press down. I'm trying to go to stop share and come back again. Can you do stop share? Oh, hold on. Here we go. And I just did it there, Brian. Let me turn. Here we back go. On. Last. This is the last slide. Okay, we got there in the end. Okay. Now, so finally, uh, and this is a picture of a cooperative meeting in the ExoMars project on the right. My conclusions are that Russian-European cooperation brought substantial scientific results in human and robotic spaceflight. The current examples are the ISS. Spectra RG and ExoMars. Cooperation does cost, but the alternative of non-cooperation is probably much costlier. Industrial cooperation brought substantial efficiency gains in launching payloads to orbit. Both sides have different areas of expertise. In a strengths or weakness model, Russia is really good at some things, not so good at others. Europe, really good at some things, not others, okay? The Euro EU decision to hit the Russian space program since 2014 is a real problem. And I've, I've no idea how can that can be dealt with. So I'm going to finish by saying thank you for your attention. Apologies that I've run over time because of our minor technical issues here. And I'm going to close by saying, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Brian. I don't think we got the last slide, but we could uh, tell what it was from the, how you're reading it out. Okay. So uh, okay. Laura, I think, has been collating the questions. Is that right, Laura? Yeah, so we have one from Tom. Brian, do you feel that collaboration between Russia and Europe is open and transparent, or is there a lot of hiding of technology results, etc., by each side? I'm sorry, could you give me the very last bit again there? Yeah, or is there a lot of hiding of technology results, etc., by each side? of hiding of technology. Okay, yeah. I'm, so, I'm sorry, while you're doing this, I'm going to try get the last slide up again so you can see it. Okay. Um, the last slide. There you go, okay. Um, I don't imagine there's a lot of hiding of technology. I think both sides know what the other side has. Uh, I have an impression that both European and Russian programs are fairly open at this stage in terms of our knowledge of the other. Where they are not open though, is in military programs. Uh, the Russians do have, of course, have a military space program of earth observation, uh, signals intelligence, and so on and so forth. Um, on the European side, I should emphasize to you that ESA, the European Space Agency, does not do military activity. Um, but the individual European countries that our members of ESA have their own national and bilateral programs in which they do do military work. For example, France, Italy, and Spain have military observation and communication satellites between them. But that is quite outside the scope of official uh, Russia-Europe cooperation or indeed non-cooperation. So I, th I think on both sides, 
each side has a fair idea of what the other does and a good knowledge of what they do. So is there much hiding going on, except in the military area? I don't think so. Okay, thank you. Um, Edward Malarkey asks, any effect on the ASS due to the sanctions? I I'm sorry, could you say that again? Yep, any effect on the ASS due to the sanctions? Any effect on the? International Space Station. Ah, um, no, not yet, except that the cooling of cooperation, I suspect, um, has had something to do with there no longer being European astronauts in Star Town. Um, but you could also say that's as a result of the previous arrangements running out. Uh, certainly the effect on the International Space Station so far has been rather limited, but I did signal to you and repeat to you that if the United States hits the progress factory, um, the Russians are, the Russians will not be able to launch, use the Soyuz rocket anymore, and it's their main launcher. Uh, they will try to substitute their own um, computer chips for the bits that the Americans have sanctioned, but that will take them some time. So in hitting progress like this, the Americans have hit a definite uh, weakness uh, in uh, Russian technical ability, uh, and it will have an effect over time. When you say hit there, Brian, you don't mean military hit, it's a sanction hit, is it? Well, the, the, there are two sets of, there, sorry, there are several sets of sanctions. The original sanctions were introduced uh, in March 2014 by the United States. The European Union introduce very similar sanctions uh, within the following two weeks. <clears throat> the particular issue with the progress plant is that these were sanctions introduced at the end of the Trump presidency in December of last year, uh, but they have not been um, revoked by the Biden administration and it would probably take an act of Congress to uh, undo them. Uh, but it is, I think it is a real problem <clears throat> if you're trying to do cooperation certainly from the European point of view, if the head of the Russian Space Agency is prohibited uh, from entering uh, Europe. Uh, and indeed, when they had a, a conference to discuss, will we or will we not um, uh, postpone ExoMars from 2020 to 2022, that conference had to be virtual because Europe prohibited Dmitry Rogozin from entering European Union territory. Indeed, at one stage, when he was trying to enter European territory, his plane was forced down. Uh, he was denied entry to Romania as he was about to fly over it, and he had to. He was forced down to land in Moldova uh, instead. Um, so that it's not it's not just one country that does uh, plane for, force downs here. So there's a very sharp edge to all of this, which is not a good sign for cooperation into the rest of this decade. And just to confirm. Russia has pulled out of renewing their ISS contracts and is going with China. That's still correct, is it? Uh, what has happened there is just on, on the International Space Station, you, you've probably seen various reports that quote, Russia is leaving the International Space Station. Mm. I, I'll come on to China in just a second. I know you've asked about China. Uh, Russia does not plan to leave the International Space Station. Russia does not want to leave the International Space Station. That would hardly be the case if it's about to launch on the 21st of this month. It's biggest ever scientific module to the International Space Station and it wants to get the use of it clearly. Um, the Russians do want to build their own space station, which will fly in polar orbit, where it can observe the Russian landmass, which the ISS is not well placed to do. But the Russians have never had a problem about running more than one space station at the same time. They did this during the Mir period. So it's not an either or for them, it's both. Um, the freezing out of Russia by the United States and Europe from cooperative efforts, combined with the fact that China has been under sanctions since 1949 and still is, means that if you force uh, if you impose sanctions on Russia and simultaneously on China, you will inevitably drive uh, Russia and China together. Uh, this is not this is not rocket science, as they would say. Um, so that Russia and China have, in fact, been saying, "Well, look, um, 
Chinese have been saying, well, we can't do anything with the Americans, it's prohibited. Um, the Americans prohibit a lot of European activity uh, with China as well. Um, we've had this very cold wind coming against us since uh, 2014, particularly uh, from the West is what the Russians will say. So you inevitably start looking for um, a partnership between the two of you. So the um, Russia and China have discussed cooperation on space stations, but the real work of cooperation is going to be on the International Lunar Research Station, which was announced in St. Petersburg uh, last month. And that is the plan to build a Russian Chinese scientific base at the South Lunar Pole, so that by 2040, for the sake of argument, we may have both an American led base at the South Pole uh, and also a Russian Chinese base at the South Pole. One thing that was quite important here is that when the Americans proposed the framework agreement for uh, the American um, lunar base called the Artemis Accords, the Americans made it very clear what they were planning and in effect said to Russia and the other countries, join us if you wish, but we lay down the ground rules. Okay, That was not how the International Space Station was constructed. The International Space Station was constructed by Russia and the United States coming together as equal partners um, and um, designing the space station then in cooperation with Canada, Europe and Japan. Um, but th the Russians said, well, we are not at all happy about being a minor um, a contributor at American discretion in Artemis. We are a great spacefaring nation, thank you very much. We have kept the ISS going uh, when the shuttle was grounded twice. We kept the ISS going from uh, uh, 2011 to 2020. And now you want us to be a very junior partner. No thanks. Russia is still way ahead in many aspects of spaceflight, particularly rocket, rocket engine technology is an outstanding example. Computers are another. Um, and it, it, I, I think if, I, if most people here, if you were Russia, would see taking a very subordinate role in Artemis uh, was not something that was acceptable or respectful. So they said, let's do business with a country that will show us some respect. I think that's what it comes down to. Thank you. Sandra asks, why does Europe dislike Dmitry Roganov so much? I'm sorry, say that again, please. Why does Europe dislike Dmitry Roganov so much? Dmitry Rogozin, it's it's oh. very interesting that when the sanctions were drawn up, um, they targeted people who they said supported uh, the Russian action in Crimea, okay? Uh, and Dmitry Rogozin was quoted as having supported it, okay? Now, on that basis, you could probably sanction pretty well everyone in Russia, okay? I've never seen a public statement by him supporting it, okay? I guess he probably did so, but he was not a prominent vocal political supporter. He was working for the government at the time. He was in his early career, a uh, participant in the Duma, the Russian parliament, uh, was then briefly in, Dmit in uh, 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 Vladimir Putin's own party, but then he became a, a, effectively a, a government appointed worker. Um, and uh, the companies that were sanctioned were those that was considered to be involved in military, and technical production, uh, dual use technologies, which is always a dodgy area. In other words, equipment that could be used for the military. But I mean, anyone here who drives a diesel car will be aware that diesel engines power tanks. So does that mean that all diesel engines are dual technology? You can just debate that between yourselves. Um, and individuals were identified on this European list um, who were considered to be close political associates of Dmitry Rogozin, sorry, excuse me, of Vladimir Putin. And these, this list included Dmitry Rogozin. Now I have seen political analysis of the leadership of Russia, and it does not include Dmitry Rogozin. Okay. Um, and um, what I, what puzzles me greatly, and it's the biggest mystery of this research is why did Europe whose space industry has so much cooperation with Russia, cooperation that goes back, as you know, now to 1966, 
There are 400,000 people working in the space industry directly in Europe and twice that again indirectly, okay? When space cooperation with Russia is so important and it's one of the forces that reduce political tension, why do you hit the head of the Russian space agency, Roscosmos, okay? I don't know the answer to that question. For that reason, for this research, I sent in uh, freedom of information requests to the European Union Council of Ministers. This was initially re refused on the basis that revealing why Dmitry Rogozin uh, was identified for sanctions, to reveal this would be prejudicial to peace in Europe. Um, I appealed this and to my amazement, I have to say I won. And I was given a text, which you will see in my book, um, which refers to this newspaper article. In, in, it wasn't in Commerçant, which is the leading um, Russian commercial magazine, like the Financial Times in Britain, for example, but a less well-known Russian commercial financial newspaper, which is um, so less well-known that I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of it, but it is in the book, okay? And it had this machine translated text, which said that, <coughs> um, uh, and as I, I said to you in my presentation, um, Dmitry Rogozin had presented Vladimir Putin with a photograph of the Kerch Strait Bridge, okay, which they had been shooting for many times. It had been shot many times, which was a funny where translation in English of the word to film. And the word shoot, shoot, shoot gives a rather bellicose overtone to that. So it was not only a machine translation of a text in an obscure or not well known anyway, Russian commercial magazine, but a machine translation when the European Union had 4,600 translators at its disposal. And it was of a bridge which is photographed almost every day by European satellites, okay? But because Dmitry Rogozin had given this photograph taken by a Russian satellite, the picture I showed you, by the way, I think was a European photograph of a bridge that had been condemned by the European Union, okay? So far as I know, it's the only time the European Union has condemned an inanimate object, okay? Um, but it also shows an extraordinary pattern of decision making within the European oh, Union. Yeah. Supposed to be on my earphones. So I'm sorry, that's not a satisfactory answer to your, in my view, very good question. Uh, it doesn't tell you what you want to know, which is why was Rogozin singled out uh, for being hit. Nobody comparable to him has been identified that I'm aware of, okay? Some oligarchs here and there, some cronies here and there, or so we're told, but why the head? It, it, imagine if um, uh, Russia and China decided to hit Bill Nelson, the administrator of NASA, and tell everyone he is unwelcome to set foot in our territory, okay? What signal would that send? because the sanctioning of Dmitry Rogozin is sending exactly the same signal to Russia. The head of your space agency is not welcome. Any more questions there, Laura? Yeah, there's just one more. I'll tell you what, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll, go, I'll pose one to Brian myself and then take your one as the last question, okay? Yep. So Brian, a question about Europe-Russia cooperation. What about Ireland? I know that Professor Susan McKenna Lawler did a lot with the Russians. I think some people in DS did as well. Do you cover much of that in your book or is it more of a pan-European approach? Yeah, um, no, I've, I've tried to identify all the individual countries and Susan McKenna Lawler's contribu contribution to a number of Russian missions, but most prominently the Mars missions, in particular the Phobos missions, uh, are the outstanding point. Ireland has not turned up uh, much elsewhere in this story. Um, and I've been looking for Ireland. Believe me, if the word Ireland had appeared anywhere in this story, um, it, uh, it would have struck me straight away. Um, one thing, if I could give you a, a comparison, um, uh, I went to a, a conference in, in Russia several years ago uh, of all their scientists, um, where they were um, presenting papers on their recent work and research and so on. And it was an international meeting. 
And one of the questions I ask myself is, who's here? In other words, what countries are they from? Okay. And uh, the French, no marks for this, led the field, followed by the Germans, um, one or two Italians, no British, no Irish. Okay. Um, so there seems to be very little cooperation in, in recent years. Uh, I searched in vain to try found other examples of Irish contributions. I didn't find them. Um, it's something that could be done, arguably should be done. Um, but as one um, person spoke to me, uh, it's, it's always NASA, NASA, NASA. Now there's nothing wrong with that, but we tend not to think very much. We not tend ourselves not, this is the long answer to your question, David. We tend not to think so much of, should we do business with Russia in the area of scientific space research? Um, and in particular, it's, it's very evident in, in Britain whenever they, the British discuss international cooperation, and we tend to follow the British model in many respects, they get straight on a plane to um, America. They don't even go to Europe very much either, uh, though we do. Um, but examples of Irish cooperation with Russia have been limited, but I think we're not looking there. Working with Russia requires a bit of extra effort. Um, we need to face up to the issue of how do we deal with the Russian language at these points. Um, it's not as easy as dealing in English all the way, but then that's laziness as much as anything else. So I think there have been, I, I didn't put Ireland down as uh, on my list of lost opportunities, but I'm wondering where there are opportunities of cooperation with Russia that we missed over the years and could still be missing over the next number of years. It's a question I'd, I, would, I would put back to people here. Thank you. Laura, uh, last question to close with. Yeah, so is exploration by individual countries productive or counterproductive in the long term, i.e. all the various Mars probes? And that's from Ronnie Kilkenny in Dublin. Yes, I'm sorry. I think I got most of that. Would you mind reading it again, please? Yeah. Is exploration by individual countries productive or counterproductive in the long term, i.e. all the various Mars probes? Ah, OK. <clears throat> it's, it's a good question. My general view would be certainly in Europe, it's better for Europe to do things together. It's, it is very good that Ireland is in ESA, for example. It is very good that Ireland plays the role that it does within ESA. It's an example of a, a small nation punching above its weight. Um, and um, doing things cooperatively means that you can get the best strengths and advantages from each individual country. When it comes to the Mars um, program at the moment, I think what you have in mind in the fact that Mars is being explored at the moment by Russian European probes, the TGO that's still in orbit there, by China, by the United States, um, by indeed the United Arab Emirates more recently, by India earlier. Um, are there some inefficiencies as a result of that? I would imagine so. Um, is it the case though that countries tend to select out those areas that the other countries don't do? Yes, I think that is the case. And for example, um, neither perseverance nor curiosity on the American side looks for life, okay? So Europe with ExoMars, with Russia, is doing the life searching laboratory, the drill that is on ExoMars that other countries aren't doing. Some of the instruments do duplicate one another, but I, I, I'll give you an example for an it, 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 that, that is making the argument for the individual cooperation for once, which is not a trendy thing to, to advertise. The whole issue of methane in Mars. We are only going to get to the bottom of the issue of methane on Mars. And there are some recent papers out in the past few weeks uh, indicating how to explain the fact that some countries are finding more methane than others. You're only going to get an answer by different countries having different instruments calibrated in different ways, attacking the problem from different dimensions and different angles. Uh, so there are some advantages to doing that generally um, I would have thought you're better to share and to plan together, um, even if you don't have formal discussions with the 
other countries, you have a fair idea what they're doing, which comes back to our very first question, are countries hiding things? I think not because things are fairly open. So most countries do not deliberately, intentionally duplicate what they know other countries are going to do. They find little niches for themselves. So I, I think most people's preference is for countries doing things together, but the differences that we have at the moment do lead to some, maybe more by accident than by design, to some good scientific results. But it's a very good question. I think it's, a, it's an issue we, that could be uh, profitably um, explored by many people at a different stage. Excellent, Excellent Brian. Thank you very much indeed. I think we're going to leave the formal questions there. If you have time want to stay online, we'll go for some informal ones in a moment. I briefly want to tell people about very exciting things that are happening in the, in the sky. Uh, but before that, we have to tell everyone, don't forget to go along to springer.com. Uh, I'm sure if you search for Brian Harvey, his books will come up. If you want to know more, including all the things Brian referred to, he obviously can't cover everything in his book uh, in one short lecture. It's bound to be packed full of information. And I'm sure everyone will agree that Brian definitely is a world expert on the subjects he writes and researches on. And again, let me thank him for his column in the magazine, what's happening on the International Space Station every month. I know he's already submitted his August copy uh, and we're very grateful for that as well. So a big thank you to Brian. And I'll briefly tell you what to see in the sky because a couple of really interesting things. Most of this is in the magazine, by the way. Brian mentioned, the International Space Station is going to have a visitor. And if you want to see that space chase, then follow us on social media. We uh, actually have the International Space Station flying over four times tonight. But the first one's just after midnight. So technically it's a morning object. But from tomorrow on, there will actually be a, a low down pass in the evening before midnight. And they get earlier and earlier. So the very high passes will be happening in the evening sky. So we should see that space chase. And indeed other ones There was... One last week that we were uh, trying to get people to watch if they like getting up at dawn. I tried myself, but clouds thwarted me every time. Let's hope we'll have better luck this time. So from tomorrow for two weeks, we've got the ISS flying over in evening skies, as well as the space chase. The moon's in the evening sky, and ISS can pass in front of the moon. I've seen this happen from Ireland a few times myself. And we always tell people in these social media posts, which are completely free to everybody in the country, where to be, so where you need to be in Ireland to see that. We'll also actually tell you when it passes near Jupiter or Saturn uh, to be somewhere where it passes directly in front of those planets, which happens in a tiny fraction of a second. It's quite tricky. With the moon, I've actually videoed it. And if you play it back frame by frame, you'll see several frozen images of ISS crossing the moon. And other people have done this. People have been getting the magazine for years will have seen those pictures. So it's very exciting times coming with viewing the ISS in evening skies from Ireland over the next two weeks. Get onto our social media, go to astronomy.ie, you'll see the links to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and follow those, and we won't let you down telling you when and where you need to be. So what else is happening? Well, I won't go into great detail, it's in the magazine. Jupiter and Saturn are in evening skies now. Jupiter is the really easy to see because it's brighter than all of the stars, and Saturn is just one hand span at arm's length to the right of Jupiter. Uh, 15 times dimmer than Jupiter, but still as bright as the brightest stars in the sky. If you've got a telescope, you'll have great fun looking at the great red spot on Jupiter, its moons, and Saturn with its moon Titan and its lovely rings. There's details of that in the magazine. There is one other planet that you can sort of see, and it's very important tonight, and that's Venus. Now, you need to know exactly where to look at the moment, because it's very low on the western horizon. Once I find it, I can see it with the naked eye in strong twilight, just before it dips below the horizon. But tonight, if you look at your magazine, you'll see that Venus is to the lower right of the moon. And the moon, it was near it yesterday, but the moon was a thinner crescent. Tonight, the moon's a thicker crescent because it's higher up, and it should be easy to see. And then look to the lower right, there's an exact diagram in your magazine, if you want to see exactly what that looks like. And start viewing about an hour's time when the sun sets around 10 p.m. And if you do see it, let us know. The other thing is when you find Venus, take a close look with your binoculars or a telescope because Mars is extremely close to Venus uh, just tonight and tomorrow night. It's about one moon diameter away. 
half a degree, the field of view of a medium sized telescope. So you'll see the two planets in the same field of view. Uh, Mars, though, is about 200 times dimmer than Venus. So you're going to need a telescope for that. Not even sure you'll see it in binoculars. So, and I just looked at the satellite picture during the Q&A session there. There's lots of broken cloud over Ireland. So some places are going to get clear sky. So make sure it's you or that you see it if those skies happen in your location. Once you've found where Venus is, courtesy of the moon this evening, remember that because tomorrow night, Venus and Mars are the very closest, tiny bit closer than they are tonight, just a half a degree apart, 0.6 of a degree tonight, 0.5 of a degree tomorrow night. And again, there's a diagram in the magazine showing what's happening over the next few nights with Venus and Mars. It's a very rare conjunction where they just line up. Uh, but unfortunately, it happens very low down in the twilight sky this time. There'll be other conjunctions uh, during the rest of your lifetime that we'll keep you appraised of in the magazine. So th they're the main highlights, Jupiter, Saturn, Venus and the ISS. Uh, Saturn and Jupiter are actually near the moon at the end of the month on Saturday and the 24th of July. That's Saturday week, isn't it? And Sunday week, the 25th. And details of that are in the magazine. Uh, so they're the main highlights. There's other things for you to see in the magazine if you want to take a look at it. Always check out the diary dates column. Uh, but just as our, our next talk is on August 9th, so just three days after that, so just to whet your appetite, is the maximum of the Perseid meteor shower. And it's well worth mentioning this year because the moon is out of the way, which means if you're in a town or a city, get out into the countryside. I, I've done this before and I've seen 20 shooting stars and meet Perseids every 15 minutes, which is what we're going to be asking people across the country to do. Count how many you see every 15 minutes. Uh, so that's let's hope for clear skies on August 12th, the maximum night. But you'll see quite a few the night before, about half as many, and quite a few the night after. But maximum night, about 20 times more shooting stars than normal. It's the biggest producer of fireballs of all the meteor showers each year. So it's definitely one for your diary in case you can't make the August meeting. Uh, other things are happening. They'll, these will be in the members' email. That Nova and Cassiopeia seems to be fading, but who knows? Uh, the, there was a, was a bit of a sunspot rotated into view yesterday, but it seems to be shrinking. But you never know with sunspots. We'll check that out and tell you more on, on Wednesday morning. And there's always a chance of an aurora. There's a very minor chance tonight. It's really for uh, the Arctic and Antarctic region, so we didn't promote it in social media. Um, but you never know. Sometimes they get it wrong and things are a lot stronger. Of course, other times are a lot weaker than it's predicted. So enjoy your magazine. What's happening in the future in terms of events? Well, uh, don't forget the Sky at Nights on BBC Four, Wednesday night, two nights from now at 11.40 p.m. Uh, and also July the 20th, the anniversary of the first moon la manned moon landing. Uh, Jeff Bezos is hoping to go into space, so I'm sure you'll see that in the media at the time. Found to be another frenzy like there was yesterday. Uh, and of course, our evening classes are enrolling now. So if you're interested in learning more over the course of eight Wednesday nights in October, then uh, go to astronomy.ie and click on classes there. And tell all your friends to do so as well. It's aimed at people have no knowledge of astronomy. Uh, it's not a mathematical course. It's, it really is for beginners. So that brings us to the end. Just to tell you about our, la our next meeting, uh, as I said, they normally happen the second Monday of the month, which is the 9th of August next month when we're delighted to have Professor Andy Shearer back. Uh, he's going to talk on a very interesting topic, not directly related to space exploration this time, so it's nice to mix it up, but he's going to talk about what will the next decade in astronomy bring? And the answer is we, we will be bamboozled by what's coming because the James Webb Space Telescope is coming along. The extremely large European telescope is coming along which actually had an Irish engineer who gave one of our past talks about it. And in the simulations of the images that they expect to get from this monster telescope, it's a huge shift in, in telescope technology. It, it, they're already building it in Chile and it should be online in 2025. And I can tell you the, the images they expect make the Hubble Space Telescope look like a poor quality pair of binoculars. So we're really excited about 2025 and there are other projects as well. Andy Shearer uh, will explain all those on August the 9th. You can go along to astronomy.a, book a ticket. You can do it free or make a small donation. Do that now um, if, if you want to. And don't forget, you know, if you're not already getting the magazine, do sign up as a member of Astronomy Ireland. Become a part of the world's most popular astronomy club. 
and we'll keep you posted of all the events and other things happening in the sky every week on the email and every month in the magazine. David, so, David. that's the end of the form. Oh, sounds like Anne has an announcement to make as well. Go ahead, Anne. To say that the, in the August magazine, uh, Brian, there's an article by Brian about the China missions, and also Kevin Nolan will be reviewing Brian's fantastic new book very soon, probably in September. Well, there's a sneak preview from our managing editor and Dunn herself. <laughs> okay. I, I dare say we might have some coverage of Richard Branson as well. Uh, yes, we've been. But I don't think today. I think we'll be go going to the printers the day before. Jeff Bezos 